Hello, everybody. I wish you all a very warm welcome to the seventh SGNA webinar. Our topic tonight is artificial intelligence, um, maximizing effectiveness of in artificial intelligence and, and its implic uh, implication on therapy. And we will look at the nurse's perspective. My name is Ulrike Balnoff. I'm the SGNA scientific secretary and uh, I'm an endoscopy nurse. I work as a nurse teacher and I live in Ulm in Germany. I have a co-chair and I would like to introduce Professor Dr. Helmut Neumann. So Helmut, if you introduce yourself, please. Yes, thank you so much, Ulrike, and thank you so much for your very kind invitation. Such a pleasure being again with you here on the Isgina uh, webinar educational this evening. Thanks so much for joining. I'm Helmut Neumann from Germany, professor of medicine, and uh, I had the great luck uh, being able to attend a couple of your meetings. And I'm very much looking forward to this very exciting session today. Thank you so much. Yeah, artificial intelligence um, yeah, goes back to the 1950s. And um, when mathematicians asked a simple question, can a, can a ma machine really think? Yeah, it can think. And uh, nowadays, AI is a key technology for us and it's um, part of our daily life. We have it in digital voice assistance and intelligent household um, applications and we have autonomous uh, vehicles and intelligent mobile uh, concepts um, and we also have in production a cooperative uh, robots. So artificial intelligence is really part of our daily life but also in medicine and uh, in gastroenterology um, it's clearly focused on uh, the diagnosis of polyps, early lesions, and so on. And that is the play, the, the field, what we would like to discuss today. So uh, you see here our agenda, and we will have a look at the technical perspective, and then followed by the uh, clinic, uh, clinical benefits. Um, but we also want to have a look at the hygiene and equipment care, because that also influences the uh, quality of AI. And later on, we have um, a look at the tissue treatment, and it's also uh, it's cl close connected to AI. So, first we would like to know something about you. Um, who are you? Who is listening to our, um, uh, our webinar tonight? So, we would like to ask you to um, click later on the uh, questions. Um, you see here the pop-up window and um, please click, are you a nurse or a nursing staff? Or are you a nurse endoscopist and a clinical nurse specialist? Or are you a physician, a nurse teacher, or are you coming from industry? So that would be nice to see. Um, we usually have a big variety of um, yeah, yeah, audience um, listening the SGNA, uh, watching the SGNA webinars. Um, and it's good to see where the audience is coming from. So the majority are uh, endoscopy nurses with 45%, but we have also nurse endoscopists with 18%. Uh, no physician is uh, uh, joining us, so <laughs> you will have the flag for the physicians, but perhaps uh, later another one will join us. We have a nurse teacher and also a large number of uh, people from industry. So welcome. We have another question for you, and we would like to hear from you how you use uh, AI in your um, uh, department. Uh, the question is, um, does all the endoscopists use AI, or are they only used, is this only used by the specialists? Or do you, you, or do you not use uh, AI in daily routine? And uh, in case you are not working in endoscopy like myself in daily routine as a teacher or even as industry, then you click the last um, uh, click box. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that will be also a topic we will discuss later, no, Helmut, um, who is using AI because it's an upcoming techni uh, te uh, technological issue and we will see how um, we can use it in daily routine. No? Yes, sure. I, I feel you absolutely, uh, absolutely astonished by this fantastic audience here. And I just looked at the participating 
um, colleagues, because I feel we are all colleagues, yeah, because we're all doing endoscopy in our routine clinical practice. And I also want to send my very warm welcome to good friends like Sabine Schomburg or Hilda Willekens uh, from uh, the Leuven University, who's also very much involved in artificial intelligence. So maybe when there are some questions, even because I, I can see there are really experts participating today, please use the chat function below, communicate with us. We really want to do it interactive together with you. And again, thank you so much for taking the time being with us uh, together in this afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, and in the, ma the um, uh, majority have um, not really, um, uh, an, uh, let's say, the use of AI in daily routine, but we also have uh, specialists um, or departments who use uh, where all the endoscopists use it with 15% and uh, in some departments, in 9% of the departments, only the, endo the specialists use it. So, and we have a very final question. Um, uh, artificial intelligence is a new technology and we would like to know what do you think, what is your knowledge about that? Do you think, oh, I know how it works? Or do you think, hmm, I have heard about it, I know something about it, but not so much? Or do you think I have no experience at all and no knowledge at all? So please answer the three questions, or the three, the three clicks of the three answers, and we'll see how it is. And as Helmut already said, we have a chat function and the Q&A, and you can use both. So, ah, so the majority of you say, ah, I've heard about it and I know how it works. Um, I have some ideas that are um, 35% and some said, oh, I have no idea at all, that's 20%. Good. So, as I said, um, please use the um, Q&As and uh, the chat function and um, Helmut and I will um, uh, pull your questions and uh, then we can discuss it with you later. So we would like to go to the first speaker and it's my great pleasure to introduce Saskia Papa. Uh, she's from the Netherlands and live in Germany now in, uh, in Düsseldorf. Um, she is really an expert um, uh, with the new technologies and um, responsible for the product uh, development and um, also takes care of the Q, uh, uh, KOLs um, and um, take care of the clinical studies. Um, so we would like to know a little bit more about AI and all the technical backgrounds, Saskia. Sure. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, also a warm welcome from my side to everyone who is joining uh, this evening. And um, I am pleased to talk uh, in this presentation the next 15 minutes about AI, um, especially in endoscopy. And uh, just to give you a few of the focus points that uh, I will answer during this presentation is uh, on one hand side, what are important challenges in endoscopy and also what kind of supporting uh, AI functions uh, does uh, AI systems provide for endoscopists. So, uh, if we have a look at the agenda, I will start uh, with what is AI and how does it work? Um, and then after this more general introduction to go a bit more into details in AI uh, for endos endoscopy. And at the end also to uh, ex explain a bit more uh, on one of the uh, systems in endoscopy for AI, which is CADI. Um, so let's start with uh, AI uh, more in general. So AI, like we all know, artificial intelligence are like, uh, yeah, super intelligent machines that work and react like humans. But we see it also a lot in our daily life uh, around us. Like, for example, when you look at Netflix, um, when you uh, watch some movies or series, Netflix will then at one point suggest you some uh, series or movies that you might be interested in. This is also based on uh, artificial intelligence uh, technology, uh, but also Facebook, for example, uh, when you post a picture, it will uh, suggest you who you can tag in there from your friends. So it recognizes the faces. Um, we have Siri or Alexa uh, for speech recognition. Uh, there is face recognition when you open your mobile phone, for example. 
um, but also what we heard already before, like the development of self-driving cars. So there is a lot of um, yeah, AI technology already around us and we get in touch with it actually every day. Um, and uh, artificial intelligence is based on yeah, like algorithms and we can uh, differentiate uh, the two main types of uh, AI, which is on the one hand uh, based on machine learning and this is actually the AI technology where it all started with in the early beginnings. Um, and here, actually, we as human, we define what the computer is learning. So, for example, here we have an example with red apples and green apples. So we will uh, provide the computer with a lot of images and we will tell the computer, this is a red apple because of this uh, reason or this feature. And this is a green apple because of these features. So the computer is learning this and uh, can then later on recognize these things. But uh, this is applicable for more yeah, basic or simple um, applications. But if we go a bit more into uh, more complex tasks, like, uh, for example, in healthcare, um, then uh, deep learning is applied which is that the, um, yeah, the AI supercomputer is fed with a lot of different images, but the computer is uh, defining and learning himself how to recognize a red apple and how to recognize a green apple. So what are the features for one and what are the features for the other? So it's developing its own algorithms uh, in order to uh, yeah, really um, uh, resolve more complex, complex uh, tasks. And um, yeah, so the machine is really trained using a large amount of, of data and algorithms to, to perform this. So um, if we have a look at the development and the history of AI within uh, Fujifilm, um, we already have like a long experience in this. And as Ulrike said, it uh, all started in the 1950s where uh, we also as a company started to develop uh, artificial intelligence technology, but uh, when it really came into more uh, use was in 2007 when it started with the uh, in the camera business uh, when there was real time face recognition. But of course, this kind of know how and uh, knowledge can be also uh, applied in then other fields than camera business. So also in the medical field. And um, since 2008, uh, we also um, developed and um, started to have AI applications in um, healthcare with uh, radiology and mammography, but uh, later as well in uh, informatics or uh, with the automatic organ uh, recognition and now as well in endoscopy. So, if we have a bit uh, closer look on AI in endoscopy, um, the first module of uh, AI in endoscopy is based uh, on uh, yeah, colonoscopy. So it's really um, designed for um, colonic polyps. So, and if we have a look um, like on a broader scale, we see that uh, colorectal cancer is one of the third most common in incidence and the second one in mortality in the world, uh, based on the World Health Organization uh, data. So it is very important uh, also to have some support uh, in the detection in an early stage, for example. So for detection, uh, I think we all know that ADR, uh, which is the adenoma detection rate, is a very important quality indicator uh, of colonoscopy because it is the percentage of patients uh, of 50 years or older that undergo for the first time a screening colonoscopy and who have one or more than one um, adenomas detected and removed. And also from some studies, we see that uh, like a 1% increase in ADR uh, results in uh, a decrease of 3% of colorectal cancer. So this is also very important uh, data to see the influence uh, that ADR has. And if we have a look at the guidelines, we see that for ADR, the minimum standard is 25% or higher. 
but also that the guidelines say that the withdrawal time as a minimum is uh, should be six minutes, but with 10 minutes as a target. Because we all know that, uh, yeah, if we take more time and longer time to inspect, there is a higher possibility as well to find uh, something. Um, and also, if we have a look at char characterization, uh, we see that uh, with education, it is also important to improve the diagnostic uh, capabilities of endoscopists so that they uh, really have a good uh, quality of making a ca characterization. Um, and also a higher diagnostic accuracy that uh, will also le could lead to a reduction in uh, cost because maybe uh, they can also leave certain uh, lesions in place instead of taking them out if the um, characterization is of course very accurate with a high confidence level. So if we have a look here at the guidelines, uh, we see here that uh, it is said there that all polyps should be resected except for the ones who are five millimeter or smaller and are rectosigmoid hyperplastic polyp. And those are characterized with a high level of confidence. So there are several challenges in endoscopy. Um, and if we have a look at a few of them, we see, of course, that there is a difference in skills levels. Um, but also that endoscopists, for example, get tired over time, which is normal because we are all human. Um, but also studies shown that, uh, for example, there is a 12.4% reduction um, in the detection of polyps if you compare morning uh, procedures with afternoon procedures. So quite an important um, result. Um, but also, yeah, there are lesions that are very difficult to be detected. Uh, if they are, for example, very flat or also very small, cannot always be easy to, to, to find and detect. So how can AI then help here? So on the one hand, um, artificial intelligence in endoscopy can help to support the physician to detect lesions. And this can then help to improve ADR, as we've seen in the guidelines. Um, but also, on the other hand, it could uh, help the physician and give a support to the physician to characterize the lesions. Um, and this is, of course, very important, uh, as you all know, to decide what kind of treatment or therapy should be uh, considered for the patient. So if we have a look uh, overall at AI, um, AI is a computer, so it never gets tired. So it will have exactly the same uh, performance with the first procedure of the day as with the last procedure of the day. Um, it also can find multiple lesions at the same time. Um, it will alert the physician um, with uh, different signals and it also helps uh, with characterize, uh, characterization uh, in order to um, maybe increase the level of confidence and which also could then lead to a, a reduction in cost, for example, because uh, some hyperplastic lesions could be uh, left in place. So there are different systems at the moment that exist uh, for endoscopy when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, and here uh, I've highlighted the uh, most common ones uh, that we can find uh, nowadays, which is uh, from Fujifilm, the CAD-EYE system, which uh, supports detection and characterization. Um, there is also the one from Medtronic, which is called uh, GI Genius, which uh, supports in detection. Uh, then Olympus also has uh, the AI system, which is called Endo8, uh, which supports in detection. And then there is uh, Pentax as well with the uh, discovery that also supports in detection. So as we see here, uh, there is at the moment uh, one system that offers both detection and characterization. And uh, therefore, I would like to go a bit more into detail on this system so that uh, you also have a better understanding on how CAD-EYE is working. So as um, yeah, you, you saw before, it has two types of support. So on the one hand, to detect uh, colonic polyps, and in the other hand, to characterize them. And everything is done in real time. So uh, the procedure can be done in a normal standard way, 
uh, you don't need to do freezing of the image or any other manipulation, just like a normal um, endoscopy procedure. And AI will offer the support that is uh, requested. Um, so just to uh, show you how it works uh, in terms of light mode, um, uh, everyone knows, of course, uh, the standard white light. So for detection support with AI, normal white light uh, works. But also, uh, if you work with LCI, linked color imaging, which is helping uh, to create a better color contrast, because lesions normally have a different uh, color tone than the surrounding area. And LCI helps to better identify this. And this is also where um, uh, AI with detection can help. And on the other hand, with BLI for characterization, because BLI will show um, the pit patterns and the vessels in a better way, so that also the artificial intelligence can support them in characterization of lesions. So I will show you um, now a bit uh, better how it works, so you can see it uh, in this video for detection. So just a normal procedure. And as soon as here you see the system detects a polyp, you hear the beep and you see the detection box around it. So it alerts uh, that there is here a lesion that the computer is detecting. Um, so that is the detection support. So once uh, a polyp is detected, then uh, it needs to be characterized, of course. So for the characterization at the moment, there are two categories. So we have on the one hand, hyperplastic category, and on the other hand, the neoplastic category. And for hyperplastic, we work with like a green color code. So you have the, the green um, color around the circle of the, of the endoscopic image. Um, on the side, you also have the positioning map uh, where you can check where the computer is looking at so that uh, you can uh, check if you and the computer are analyzing exactly the same area. And um, this also will turn up in green when it's hyperplastic and you will see the word hyperplastic uh, on the bottom of the screen. And for example, if it is a neoplastic lesion, then it will work the same, but then the color code is yellow. And I will show it in a video here, which is uh, better to understand. So you see here the yellow color around the circle. And you see on the bottom the word neoplastic. Um, so you have the characterization of a neoplastic lesion. And always check here, the computer is analyzing uh, this uh, which area. And here it is the same for the um, hyperplastic uh, lesions. So it works the same, but here you see the uh, green color code. So that's the support for the characterization. I now would like to show you a short video of a physician that uh, is explaining how uh, the system is working. So uh, in order to have like a good understanding of how the system works, but also um, to see it in uh, real time. Oh, sorry, the video didn't. Hello, everybody. Here it is. It's a pleasure. I'm very delighted to welcome all of you here at the Gastrointestinal Endoscopy Unit at Ospitale Valduce in Como, Italy. My name is Emanuele Rondanotti, and I'm going to show you how this new unit from Fujifilm, which is the CADAI unit for polyp characterization and detection, works. This one is the new model, the CADAI model for polyp detection and characterization. The design is extremely similar to that of other LHC models. It is connected with the, the processor. The signal starts from the endoscope, passes through the processor, goes to the model, and finally is shown on the screen during the procedure. So you can, you can find out, you can see the results directly on your screen. During the colonoscopy, when you are using the CADAI system for poly detection and characterization, all the information are shown on the screen, as, as we said, but you also you can record everything just by pushing the multi-tree button here. You can see there there is uh, a written information here that you are recording and all the information are stored inside the unit. And afterwards, you can download everything 
through the door, the front door for the USB key here, but there are also some doors on the back part of the unit. When we do your procedure during colonoscopy, just pushing this button here, you activate the system. The system, the light here is green, but you can also control how the system works through a button on the handler of your endoscope. Just by pushing the button over here, the number T, the system can be activated or deactivated. At present time, it's deactivated. There is a cut off over here. Just by pushing the button, the same button, the cut is now activated. When you work with the, your endoscope and the CAD system is activated, it usually works regularly with the white light. But just pushing a button on the front part of the endoscope, the button you use it normally for shifting from one light to another one, you can go to LCI, for example. And the detection system works with both LCI and white light. Once the polyp is detected, then you can try to characterize it by shifting to BLI. Activating the BLI when the CAD eye is activated too. There is a screen appearing on the lower right quadrant of your screen, of your main screen. Everything is inside the main screen, right? Indicating that there is an area of interest which is picked up by the system and characterized, as you can see here in this image. Once the polyp is detected, then characterize it, then you can decide to remove the polyp. To not be disturbed by the signals from the CAD eye system, you can switch the CAD eye system off remove the polyp, and then restart the procedure regularly, activating again the CAD for detection and characterization for completing your procedure. For doing this kind of task, you can use uh, every single model of 700 colonoscopes, which are all um, compatible with the system. Yeah, so um, that was the short explanation. And um, if we have a look at the future, uh, because this is, of course, only the start uh, of the first AI systems uh, for endoscopy. But uh, of course, it doesn't stop here, because um, there are continuous developments uh, for AI in endoscopy. And um, of course, of now we started for support for detection and characterization of colonic polyps, but in the future we can also expect to have um, support for other areas in the in the GI tract, which uh, can be for the esophagus or the uh, stomach, for example. So it is a continuous development of which we are just standing at the beginning at the moment. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And um, yeah, if there are any questions, uh, let me know. Yeah, thank you very much, Saskia, for the very good overview and uh, the explanations. So you said that the system is self-learning. Um, so does the system learn even I have it in my own department? No, no, that's not the case, because, uh, of course, the quality has to be the same everywhere. So we cannot have like different uh, types and qualities uh, in different hospitals. So it can only be learned by one specific uh, supercomputer, which is uh, controlled in the R&D department. So there all the data will be uh, put into the into the AI system in order to develop uh, for in this example, CADI, um, and then the physicians can work uh, with the support of CADI, and um, it will be the same as it is as when you receive it. So it's not something that will learn and develop mm -hmm. over time by itself, because then it will be out of control, mm -hmm. and that's also not something that, uh, for from a company perspective, we cannot uh, yeah. put something like that on the market. Yeah. yeah. It's good that you make that clear, yeah. Because when we say, yeah, yeah uh, self-learning, oh, does it improve when I uh, when I use it? Yes. But then, as I said, uh, then it has an effect. Who is using it? No? Exactly, and that's yeah. something that is uh, not allowed, of yeah. course. <laughs> yes, you're right, and we don't want that effect either. Mm -hmm. Saskia, congratulations, fantastic talk. And it's such a great pleasure having you here because you. again, you're responsible for all the development of the new studies and even the product development of Fujifilm and uh, having you here with us and showing us you, you told us Fujifilm never stops, as we all know, and you have shown us that artificial intelligence by your company was developed already in the 80s. It was called image intelligence yeah, for uh, exactly. audio adjustment of photography. 
Uh, but now, please, if you allow us, maybe you can spoil a little bit because you already told us about detection and characterization of core rectal lesions. But of course, uh, maybe not that much in Germany, but especially maybe even in uh, UK, we're very much interested even in Barrett's esophagus, like in the US, of course. Do you feel that the very near future might bring us even a new cat eye family for upper GI endoscopy. Uh, so if you allow, maybe you can give us uh, not sure. of course correct mm -hmm. dates, but uh, maybe uh, is it's a future close by to us because it will help so many patients. Of course, of course. And a very good question. Uh, thank you very much. No, I think uh, we like, like a lot of companies are uh, in constant development of this, this AI technology and uh, as we see now, to start with support for uh, detection, characterization of colonic polyps, but uh, we, we, we never stop, as you say, we don't stand still. So, uh, of course, when you start somewhere, you want to develop it and expand it uh, also in other fields. So, of course, the CADI family will be expanded. Uh, we're working hard on it to create uh, other modules. So, uh, something definitely to expect in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Saskia. So having now the technology explained, we would like to know how to use it in clinical practice. And it's my pleasure that uh, Professor Neumann is uh, with us and uh, he's really an expert in this field. And um, his benefit is also, his advantage is also that he is uh, working at, a, at the university hospital in Mainz. So he has the uh, university background, but uh, he's also working in, um, um, in uh, GP's offices in uh, Bad Salzuflen. So you have both the outpatient and the inpatient. Uh, so it will be interesting to see uh, the clinical impact, Professor Neumann. Yeah, thank you so much, Ulrike. So again, thank you so much again for having me. It's always a great pleasure being together with you and to see how uh, successful your webinars are. And we are welcome more than 100 participants even this evening. And I've seen that most of you our colleagues, so uh, nurse endoscopists or nurses in general. So I think you all had very busy days. So again, thank you so much for participating and joining us. And it's now my great pleasure to discuss about artificial intelligence, specifically in colonoscopy. So in lower GI and in our practice, we are now using AI since more than two years. So we had the great luck being involved in the very early studies of the development as well. So we now really have a very big experience of the AI technology. And this is what I want to show you today as well. And not too much scientific data, but I want to show you how everything works. But I feel first of all, when we're discussing about um, this specific uh, topic, your question might arise, why do we need technological evolutions during a worldwide pandemic, so during COVID-19? And of course, we're all struggling very hard from the disease. But of course, it is, of course, what we all need to do in our practice. And that's the reason why we need to support from our industry partners as well to improve patient care and to improve patient outcomes, of course, as well. This is our major practice and our major aim. But of course, we also aim to improve safety and efficacy, uh, like also to improve the business. And this is a reason why indeed, even during this worldwide pandemic, we definitely now need new technological evolutions. And it's not only, of course, COVID, but I would like to say that there are major other challenges in colonoscopy, and we're not so far discussing this that much, uh, but this is the reason why I want to highlight this to you, because I've seen that some of you are also doing endoscopy in your daily practice, and most of the endoscopic procedures you might perform uh, are for all the aged people. But I feel that there is a very big challenge in endoscopy and most doctors are still not aware of this and the society is so far as well, uh, mostly even not. And this is the onset of early onset colorectal cancer. So, you know, we are doing the screening in our population at, a, at the age of approximately 50 years of age. Um, uh, in Germany, for example, for, for men at 50 years of age, for women at 55 years of age, uh, but early onset colorectal cancer is defined as the occurrence of colorectal cancer at the age less than 50 years of age. So before we recommend screening colonoscopy. And if you look at this recent publication in GAT, I feel this is so important for us to recognize because you can see that this is the age 
group of a population up to 30 years of age, so only 20 to 29 years. But you can see that there was only a very small increase of the incidence in the late in the years 90s to. Uh, 2004. Uh, the same for the population group 30 to 39, and also a very small uh, a very small decrease in the incidence in the age group 40 to 49. But please have a look what happened afterwards, and what will become the problem in our practice very soon. I guess this is a very strong increase in the incidence of colorectal cancer in the very young population. So I feel this is something what we need to discuss. Early onset colorectal cancer is at a major fast increase, specifically in Europe, and we have no ideas to screen the patients. And this is a reason why definitely we need new technological developments as well, because again, early onset colorectal cancer has no symptoms. We have no screening for it. And even at the moment, a very, very low awareness of the disease. And this is a reason why I also show it today. So we have to increase awareness of this early onset colorectal um, uh, cancer. And one of those new evolutions or revolutions, this is now, of course, the field of artificial intelligence. And we're talking about the CAT system for computer assisted diagnosis. So we're using what uh, Saskia Papa has already shown us, computer assisted modalities based on artificial intelligence to improve our diagnostic outcomes. And very important, and this is also the system what we're using in our practice in endoscopy. And this is um, the so-called um, cat eye system from Fujifilm. And you can see that this system has a specific graphic user interface. And this specific graphic user interface, um, this has um, a detection box, what all the systems so far on the market have. But also the system has a specific, as you can see, detection sound and also a visual assist circle lighting up in the direction uh, where the polyp is detected. So I feel this is extremely important because we all know that some of the polyps might be missing endoscopy. So we're advancing the snare or the uh, injection needle and suddenly the polyp is gone. We all know this from our practice, but this visual assist circle is always highlighting in the direction where the polyp is detected. So you can see the circle is now lighting up in the direction uh, in between the three or six o'clock position. And here's a polyp. And you will also see when the polyp is here at the 11 o'clock position, the visual assist circle will be lighting up in between nine to 12 o'clock. And the same here for, for the other uh, degrees. So very important to have this visual assist circle in our practice. So this is now how the system works. And I want to show you some clinical uh, uh, ideas of the system and what you can uh, see from this part is um, that uh, first of all you can hear the detection sound and sometimes the sound is much more faster than the human eye so at the beginning we thought the sound is disturbing our endoscopic procedure but uh, we have recognized that we prefer to have the sound because it really helps us to detect those lesions. This is a very small flat lesion, but very easy to miss during ongoing endoscopy procedures. Also, what I feel is very exciting that we might miss lesions in endoscopy and we all know this and some of you are also doing endoscopy in your practice. And this is something what is very important for us to understand we are missing lesions. You know, see, we are now in the ascending colon, so you can see the uh, ileocecal valve here in the back. And uh, now we are taking the instrument back. But please have a look if you're able to find the polyp. Uh, honestly, the detection sound is extremely helpful here because you can see we're withdrawing now the instrument. We're withdrawing now the instrument. You can hear the sound. Yeah. There is a little bit of delay and you're going back and you can see this very large sized lesion here. This is a lesion which might become very easy to be missed because it's directly located behind the fold here of the right flexure. But again, you already have heard the sound and maybe in the late afternoon procedure when you're already tired, this might be a lesion, although it's large, which might be relatively easy being missed. So is it now effective to use artificial intelligence uh, in combination with LCI for detection of colorectal polyps? Uh, and this is a recent paper 
uh, and you can see that the sensitivity of this system with a cat eye system was 100% by meaning that no lesion was missed by using the system. Uh, the calculated false positive frame rate was only less than 1%. And I have to congratulate uh, my co-researchers on this as well. And Mr. Jano is participating as well. So thank you so much again for being with us and for all of your support. And I've seen also that then they feel this is very exciting. And Ulrike, maybe we can discuss this later on as well. Uh, the SCAT system also allows for the first time as a new image in its endoscopy system for detection of so-called sessile lesions. So all of the sessile lesions in the study, it had been 38 sessile lesions were detected with these LCI cat eye system. I want to show you how it works in the clinical practice again. And again, you can see we are now in the ascending colon. Uh, uh, you can hear the sound. Maybe you have missed the polyp. I want to show it again. So you can hear the sound. The computer is so fast, you're going back, but you can see the typical large sessile serrated lesion here in the ascending colon. In the back, you have seen the ileocecal valve. Um, here is the ileocecal valve, and here is the large sessile serrated polyp, but it's so fast detected by the system. And again, it's so much more faster than the human eye. So calculations has been shown. It's approximately 80 times faster, 18, 1, 8, compared to the human eyes. And also, as a clinical perspective, what might become very exciting to use a system here for residual uh, correctal adenomas. And this is also what we are currently evaluating in a study uh, to show uh, that the system might also help us to identify residual neoplastic tissue after endoscopic mucosal resection. So you can see the mucosal resection scar, but the cat eye system is highlighting here residual uh, adenomatous tissue. And of course, this can be afterwards resected endoscopically. But again, detection is of course extremely important. So this was a very recent study. Um, it was an international multi-centered trial with uh, different uh, colleagues participating from Germany, from Italy. And you can see um, it was published most recently in endoscopy. I had the privilege being the senior author of this manuscript. And we have evaluated uh, the system now for detection. This is what CAT E means. And for characterization, this is the CAT X. And most important, what you can see, that the detection was extremely accurate, but also the characterization, what Saskia has already shown us, is extremely accurate with the system. And most important also, I feel this is extremely exciting that when non-experts were using the CAT system, they achieved a similar performance to the experts. So what we are now expecting with artificial intelligence that the learning curve of uh, endoscopy in the future might become much more effective for us. And I feel this is extremely exciting. But of course, I only do not want to discuss about this system, although I definitely want to show you again once only how fast it is. So you can see a real life video. So stool components, a little bit of blood, and the lumen is deflated, but the system already identifies, you can hear the sound, the system already identifies the polyp, multiple polyps here. And although the bowel is not that clean, so for a typical real life procedure, you just switch the button once as Dr. Rolandoni had shown us and you can see the neoplastic uh, uh, histology of the lesion in real time uh, as well. So there is no delay in the characterization of the lesion. You just push the button and the identification goes immediately. But is this now the only future? And we have already learned from Saskia that there will be much more coming soon because we all never stop. But also I want to share two very exciting new things for you. And maybe you haven't heard this before. And this is how the future might be also in the field of colonoscopy. And this is from a Chinese company. Most of you might not know this company. It's called Yingsheng. It's one of the largest companies for uh, medical products in China. And what they have done, they have developed a fully automatic control capsule endoscopy robot. So um, you can see that the patient will only lay down here on this uh, 
on this bed and then uh, they are swelling a capsule uh, like for small bowel capsule endoscopy and then uh, the computer is automatically recognizing the position in this situation within the stomach and the position of the capsule is automatically rotated by the computer until every part of the stomach is seen. All the pictures are transferred uh, on a web-based system interpreted by artificial intelligence and then they are getting validated by a medical doctor and then one can decide if a real endoscopy is necessary for the patient, yes or not. Of course, in Europe, we have a very good network of uh, gastroenterologists, so this might be not possible or not necessary, not so far, but you can imagine in a large country like China, uh, there are not doctors everywhere and the country is extremely large, so it might be very helpful here. Uh, because you do not need any doctor for this. Yeah, so everyone can just give the capsule to a patient and they swallow the uh, capsule and then the computer is doing it even in the mountains or in the desert. And again, uh, I feel this is very fascinating. And again, you can see how it works here. So the patient is uh, lying here. They are swelling the capsule. Uh, one but push of the button is enough. And then it's recognized automatically in the stomach where the capsule is. It's automatically rotating around the patient. And again, this system already is in practice. It is working. It's not only the future, it is working. And then it's identifying all the parts here of the stomach. It's identifying everything. All the uh, videos are transmitted to a computer and the computer is doing an artificial intelligence based evaluation of, uh, of the disease, if there is anything necessary to, uh, to treat or not. And uh, then afterwards, again, it is uh, validated uh, by a medical doctor and uh, the patient can be referred to a real endoscopy. I feel this is very fascinating. And at the end, I also want to show you something and some of you might swallow and might say, wow, what's going on there? And maybe it's a problem for us as real endoscopists, what's going on here, because um, this is something what is uh, the future in our field. And we have to be aware of this because Medtronic, one of the largest uh, medical companies in the world is doing this together with Amazon. And we are all knowing both companies and um, maybe you're also buying so much stuff with Amazon like I'm doing it every day, uh, but they have a partnership. And uh, I want to show you what they are aiming for with this partnership. And this will be the future of endoscopy, uh, especially maybe for screening endoscopy, uh, maybe not that far in Europe, but specifically in the United States. And this is uh, how it will work in the future. So the patient is just, you can see with Amazon Prime, they can just buy the pill cam. Uh, and this pill cam is delivered then by Amazon at the house. The patient is getting the capsule at home um, with a disposable uh, belt. So maybe you know already um, the capsule endoscopy systems for small bowel endoscopy um, and for small bowel endoscopy, um, you know that those are uh, uh, belts which are getting reusable, but this is a disposable belt. So they swallow the capsule um, the, again, everything is done with artificial intelligence. So the doctor, wherever they are in the world, they get a notification that everything is uh, finished. You can see um, they also have a system which is marking then the polyps here in the colon. The doctor can um, validate the findings and the results. And then very exciting what comes next. Uh, all the diagnosis will be sent to the smartphone of the patient and you can see what might be the future here, what they're aiming for. Uh, they are scheduling the colonoscopy of the patient for the same day, for sure, because the patient had already the bowel preparation or tomorrow or within the next seven days. And I feel uh, this is something what we all have to be aware of because I feel specifically with this very large companies, they will definitely bring it into the market. And they also show us when they expect to get it into the market. You can see the first trial will be in 22 already. So next year, they expect the CE approval in 23 and the same for uh, FDA submission in 23 as well. So I feel the future might be that indeed um, uh, colorectal cancer screening might become very 
very uh, prominent by means of capsule endoscopy. Although this would mean traditional endoscopies would get much more patient for curative endoscopy, so for resection of colorectal polyps. So at the moment, we're getting a lot of referrals for screening, but I feel maybe in the future we'll get much more uh, patients where we know that they have polyps and then we have to detect the polyps and remove them. And this is one of the reasons why we need in the future even more of those artificial intelligence based system because we know there is a polyp, but we have to find it and the faster we're able to find it, the more efficient we can work in our practice. So I feel this is something where we do not have to be afraid of, but we have to welcome this uh, development and definitely uh, we cannot stop it and we should not stop it because it's already on the the way and I'm very much looking forward to it. So um, I feel in conclusion, uh, dear Ulrike um, and dear colleagues, I feel we have seen that the CAT-Eye system indeed allows for enhanced uh, detection of colorectal lesions in real time. Very exciting that we have seen that all of those sessile rated lesions were detected with the LCI CAT-Eye system as well. Non-experts, I feel this is very exciting, are becoming experts with artificial intelligence, so maybe fostering the learning curve. And I would say at the end, indeed, the future, in my opinion, is very exciting and extremely promising for us as endoscopists. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Helmut. Very nice um, presentation. We already got some questions. The time is a little bit running, but uh, I would like to um, un to ask the question. It was one was concerning the withdrawal uh, time. Does it increase or decrease the withdrawal time? Because that is a crucial point. Also, when um, you have to document uh, the cases. I love this question. Thank you so much. And of course, you're right. So we have a minimal withdrawal time at the moment of six minutes. Mm -hmm. We have to imagine that this uh, was published so many years ago with very old scopes. Uh, there are new, no, no new studies with high definition endoscopy, specifically nothing with AI. So I cannot answer it. So far, the recommendation is still six minutes but we need prospective randomized trials to show that maybe in the future we can even spare some time on the withdrawal. Definitely so far AI can increase the confidence. So we are more confident that we have not missed the polyp. Mm. You already mentioned the serrated lesions. So with the, uh, with these, um, uh, yeah, identification, you really increase also the, let's say quality of, endos of uh, colonoscopy. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. And I've shown you even the problem of early onset colorectal cancer. And the reason of this is definitely the sessile serrated lesion, specifically in the right colon. So when we're using such a technology, I feel that we are much more efficient and we can improve the diagnostic outcome of the procedures. At the moment, the recommendation is more or less to use AI-based system mm -hmm. for traditional screening colonoscopy. But I feel even based on the experience on um, uh, early onset colorectal cancer and what we're also doing in our practice, we are using it specifically even for the young population. And we are sometimes very surprised how many of those sessile serrated lesions we are finding because of the CAT-I system, yeah. And does it also help you um, with a decision um, which polyps you or which lesions you reject and which not? Well, I feel this is a very exciting and very good question. So, so far the system is characterizing and Saskia has shown us the more advanced one is from Fujifilm because mm -hmm. it's the only one which allows for both detection and characterization. At the moment, it shows us uh, detection neoplasia um, and, and hyperplastic lesions. Uh, so um, in Europe, we do not have that much discussion of the resect and discard strategy. So we are mostly following that every polyp which is detected is really resected as well. Even for reimbursement purposes, of course, this is very exciting and very important to recognize. But with those systems, this might change in the near future. You're right, yes. Mm. And you, you showed when you... Um... Um, withdraw the, the endoscope, you clearly see the, uh, or the, the system clearly identifies the polyps, which are, let's say, at the edge of the screen. But does it really recognize the polyps which are really behind the fold? Ulrike, I appreciate this question. That's a fantastic one. Of course, uh, the system can only seize what is on the screen because it's a real-time evaluation. So it can 
cannot see something what is not visible on the screen. However, I've told you that it's much more faster than the human eyes. So approximately maybe 18 to 20 times faster. So um, even when we blink very small, the system never do this. Yeah. And there is no phone for the system. It's not getting tired. Yeah. So it's not mm -hmm. thinking of having a coffee or something like this. And I feel this is the major advantage. So it is detecting lesions um, much more faster than the human eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, for this moment. I think we can discuss some other points later on. So I have now the pleasure to introduce uh, Daniela Schröder. She's a uh, clinical and hygiene specialist and in her former life, she was also working as a nurse, as an intensive care and anesthesiology nurse. So um, we would like you to answer the question, does the nurses have any influence on AI? I think so. So because um, um, this is always teamwork. It's always the, the physician and the, the assistant to, uh, performing the, um, the endoscopic uh, treatment. So therefore, four eyes are watching and also four, uh, four um, ears are hearing the beep of the artificial intelligence. And if the, the nurse has already knows how to use it and how um, what they need to do before, then it's always a, a big um, benefit for everybody. So not only the endoscopist, but also the nurse is part of the team and therefore also interested in AI and also um, supported by AI. This is my opinion. Thank you very much for this question. Um, now I would like um, and for also for the nice introduction and also warm welcome from my side. Thank you for, uh, for joining uh, this webinar to everybody. Also, especially old friends I saw on the list and also from Canada. Thank you very much with, uh, for being with us. My part of this event is to talk about the conditions which have influence on the success of AI and multi-light technology under damage prevention and hygienic aspects, not only the eyes and the ears, but also from the clinical point of view. Um, this is the content of my presentation, basics in the equipment, supporter on hardware base, uh, software base uh, support, damages or hygiene, hygiene, genic or hygiene aspects that negatively influence uh, efficiency and proposals in order to find solutions or a good way of handling. Let's start with the basics. These are general requirements that should be met. I would like to focus on these both, but additional to that, it, uh, it, it, we need a good preparation of the patient. Uh, for a better visible, visibility in the colon, but also that it's better to have a patient who knows everything what will happen to him. So therefore it's interesting to have a good preparation. We need experienced and motivated physicians as well as well-trained and experienced assistant. Maintenance on regular base as well as servicing of the equipment. These are the requirements. High quality techni technical equipment, of course, otherwise we can't use AI, and also a high level decontamination. I will come to that later on. Um, what does it mean? Um, basics, we need, of course, an endoscope. In that case, a colonoscope. We need um, a, a monitor, a high resolution monitor. We need a light source and a processor and a as an um, uh, optional one, an EUS system, uh, and this is our CAT eye system. Additionally, we would like to uh, work with uh, the what I call hardware solutions. So, for example, the CO2 uh, insufflation system, the uh, water jet or water irrigation system. Of course, a suction unit, which can be as a, as a mobile one or already installed in the um, in the uh, endoscopic theater, and this is called hardware. And this is again the artificial intelligence box. I think the others are really similar. So now I would like to come to the visual support, software based. Um, as we need a full HD monitor, but this is always uh, in all, in all uh, theaters uh, already installed. So then it's uh, good to her to be able to provide good diagnosis 
for the following is really necessary. A good resolution of the picture through the chip, so means CMOS chip or super CCD, um, or different light technology as BLI or LCI, and or we also use with the start in the past, FIS, NBI or iScan, use of the zoom and magnification options, wide angle or the observation range could be interesting, and as a good supporter and a great help, the AI system. And there are already several, several systems on the market Nicely explained by my colleague Saskia. Thank you very much on that play, on that situation. Um, I don't want to go into detail with this uh, technical parts because it was al also already explained by uh, Saskia. So let me continue. This is an overview of all specifications of colonoscopy, which complete a perfect way of performing colonoscopies. We already talked about that and uh, the light multi-light technology, the zoom, but interesting is also the outer diameter of the endoscope, the diameter um, of the working channel, the durability working channel, I already said, the bending section, especially if the polyp is located in a very difficult area, water jet, the most of the scopes, not only from our company, but also the others are equipped with the water jet, the field of view and the observation range, usability, uh, as simple, the, the simple it is that it's the best to handle it. And the insertability means, for example, the variable stiffness. So now um, I would like to talk about or to point out the impact of damages and hygienic issues on image quality and AI. This is an example of a proper clean distal tip. And here are technical details of this part. We have two light guides. We have the objective lens, which is more or less an optical system because it, it's uh, built up uh, with uh, several uh, lenses. The uh, water nozzle, which is uh, installed in order to clean the lens during the examination, the water jet nozzle and the working channel. Here, this is the optical system. And this is the uh, bending section of the of an insertion tube. So as soon, so now we talk about damages, for example, and hygienic aspects. So we would, I would like to talk about humidity in endoscopes. Here you can see black spots. So as soon moisture uh, enters the optical system, we can see these spots, all these uh, blurry parts on the screen. So. They are partly removable, but this demarcation line, uh, which shows the glue reacting on the moisture, uh, is not removable. This is a rupture in the glue, and that will stay all the time. We had it in, uh, this is really a problem in several hospitals. Um, as you can see here, all the glasses, all the lenses are glued together. So and the moisture can come in here and there is only needed a small, a small, really a small damage. And then there is not, uh, it's not tight anymore, but this is not shown. You can't see it in the leakage test. Therefore, a proper handling of the distal tip is always needed. Another kind of humidity inside the scopes is other, uh, or the, it sh it's shown by the foggy images. That's not only in the optical system, it's close to the, um, to the CMOS ship, and therefore we can find this image as well. Um, scratches can easily be seen on the screen depending on the level of the resolution quality. This is only a small scratch. Here it's not really good visible. But uh, as higher the, um, the uh, resolution is, that the better you can see the scratches on the lens. So therefore, another uh, part to be very carefully with the scope. Dirty lenses, okay. Honestly, this is a very old picture. I didn't see that, or I haven't seen it um, in my time working in the company, but maybe something similar. So dirty lenses. This scope has never been cleaned with a brush. All the material, fluids, proteins stick on the distal tip really fixed after all the uses without cleaning. So it's, it's more or less protein fixed on the, on the uh, optical system and on the light sources. But you can also see some damages, falling damages 
or here missing the glue of the rubber bit, uh, in between the, the distal tip and the light guides. So also this, it, it is possible to introduce foreign dirt from one patient to the other um, with the accessories used during the examination, examination, such as snares, and this is a high risk for the patient to get an infection. Here again, some um, dirt on around the optical system. Blood on the uh, light guide uh, is uh, really a problem. The light source got the, the information increased the, the light level, but then at the same time, the temperature will also be increased after a while. And then the, the another information to the light source, please speed up with the light. And again, uh, it will become more hot and now the blood will be fixed more than before. And so a vicious cycle starts. This is, therefore, we need to remove everything. Blockage of the um, air water nozzle does mean that, that the endoscopist is not able to push the button, the air water button anymore, or it doesn't have any effect because if it's blocked, the water can't go or come out and can't flush the lens and therefore the film or the dirt will stay on the lenses. Um, reasons for the blockages can be some material from compressed sponges or this kind of crystals which can be found if the per acetic acid is used and it's not it's a powder and not a liquid and the powder is not uh, really in a solution but only still remaining as a crystal in the in the basin. So this is a good working nozzle, but with that inside, it doesn't work anymore. So Semiticon, it's another, another point. I know a few endoscopists want to use this product in the water tank. The water tank is the, uh, uh, the water supply for the nozzle for the, in, in order to clean the lenses. So if it is um, inside, um, you can't remove the film. The film from Semiticon will be on the lens. Another point is semiticon in the irrigation system. But please be aware, you will have this kind of film on the lenses. And the second, these both involved channels can't be brushed. As a semiticon is not a solution, but a mixture, it can easily sediment, settle in the channels, and then it won't be possible to eliminate due to brush impossibility. So, and therefore, formation of biofilm can be supported. So please, if a semiticon use is asked or requested, use it uh, via a syringe and the working channel. This is the best, and then you have a good efficacy. Cable breaks, these are the dedicated locations for cable breaks, can stop the transmission. The CMOS chip and the Super CCD are located here, and if there is a stop in transmission, no picture anymore. So what can we do? This is an overview of the decontamination cycle. Contamination means um, uh, the examination, of course, but contact to the patient. Um, bedside cleaning or preliminary, preliminary cleaning. So suction of minimum 200 milliliter of cleaning solution using, this is the one, the flashing valve in change with the uh, air water button. And yeah, this is the suction unit. Um, transport and safety, safety during the transport and uh, self-protection for the staff, leak test, manual cleaning with brushing, um, and uh, with, uh, by using the manual cleaning set, which can be found in the suitcases delivered with the endoscope, not only with our scope, but this is a part of each scope also from, our, with, from the other, other manufacturer. The intermediate rinsing with tap water also by using the manual cleaning set, and then you can decide how to continue automatically with the AER means automatic endoscope reprocessor or manually. Also needed, especially in that case, the manual cleaning set, otherwise you can't fill all channel parts and then you will have disinfection channels. Final rinsing with a sterilized uh, water or a sterile filtered water, drying, the best way to dry is to connect it in a drying cabinet. And if it's not possible, please store it vertically uh, with a, in, a store, in a storage cabinet with good ventilation, without dust, no loops in order to reduce 
the amount of remaining water in the scopes or you use it directly again for the next patients. So please take care all the time of the distal tip in order to avoid crushes, damages or scratches on the lenses. Please protect it trans and transport it carefully. Don't leave the endoscope in the AER over the night after the shift. I know it's always a strange and difficult and stressful shift, but please don't leave it there. Or in the cleaning solution over the weekend, for example, of intensive care unit, uh, because they don't uh, are trained, they don't be trained in using the uh, AER. So they stay, they keep it in their in the boxes with the cleaning solution. Please ensure a sufficient drying. If no drying cabinet with separate ventilation of each channel is available, store it please in a vertical position with sufficient air supply or ventilation. This the uh, tip cleaning and lens or so on is really necessary in order to reduce or to eliminate the film and the fixed proteins from the lenses. Um, you can use a soft teeth brush or you can use a dedicated um, uh, display tip cleaner. So, and this is an example of a protection tool which can be used during transport, cleaning, storage. Sponges are also provided as a protector, uh, but depending on the material, it can stuck in the nozzle, as I explained before, and block it. The use of the flushing valve during the bedside or preliminary cleaning can reduce the number of blockages because it, uh, it enables us to flush both channel parts. You know that uh, air water channel are separated in air and water channel. And this valve uh, in change with the um, air water button enables us to minimum flush it with the water coming from the water tank. Um, so you can find it also with each scope in the suitcase or and also with different manufacturer. Here are some pictures uh, to show how it should be or also not in order to show how we can prevent the endoscope from cable breaks. The first one uh, shows the right position with, uh, with a big angle here, but no distal tip protection. The second shows loops, which can have some impact of the connector. The third one shows an angle less than 90 degrees, so cable break is a high risk. Here again, but another direction. And this we can see, uh, especially with younger endoscopists, which are not trained to stand all the time during the examination. It's a really a challenge, so I know. My conclusion, um, all technical or everything, all innovations, all technology can only be successful if the conditions are perfect. And the result of this is the best treat for the patients. And this is our aim. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Dan Daniela, for the very nice uh, presentation. It has a lot of practical uh, tips and tricks uh, you provided. Um, so, um, if I have a dirty uh, or not properly cleaned endoscope or damaged endoscope, as you showed, does it have any effect on the use of AI? I, I think so, because if there is a scratch, for example, in the middle of the optical system, maybe it, it's detected as an, uh, as an polyp or mm -hmm. it, it is uh, disturbed the detection or the characterization mm -hmm. of the AI. Therefore, it's better to have a proper cleaned and a lens system without any scratches on it. Mm -hmm. So I think we can see it definitely. And maybe the AI, I think the AI is also able to detect, but better to have the best conditions. Good. Thank you. And Dan uh, Daniela, again, thank you so much. Great talk. Very shortly, only uh, from my side, because I always love to learn from you and you're really the expert. So do you have any recommendation on how to wipe the scope with, with what type of tissue? Because I also have learned that some type of tissue, you know, for, for just for wipe the scope after the procedure mm -hmm. might also stuck the channels. So is there any recommendation from your side what we should prefer to use in order to avoid defects? Very good question. Thank you very much. 
um, I always recommend to use a lint-free cloth without any products uh, which can go into the nozzle. So it's also a medical compress. Mo mostly nothing happened to it. And also there are many, uh, many manufacturers providing not really sponges, but kind of uh, pads which can be used. Uh, in order to clean the distal tip. These are always de also dedicated for this, um, for this uh, procedure. So there shouldn't be any material going into the nozzle by using it, I hope so. So I always recommend to use a compress. Thank it's you. the easiest way. Good, I would, as the time is a little bit running and we would like to have some discussion afterwards, I would like to go on. And Helmut will, Introduce the next speaker. Yeah, it's a great pleasure introducing Dominic Blitzky. He's also from Fujifilm Network. We know each other really since a very long time now. And it's always a greatest pleasure to work with him, product manager, and always involved with the latest technologies and techniques. And uh, also what is very prominent for uh, Dominic is that he's very much, you know, uh, very much into the future, always with new ideas and so on. So um, I'm very much looking forward to learn from you on tissue treatment, uh, Dominic, and you also have a couple of questions to me what I've uh, seen so let's do a tandem talk together for, for for the colleagues here yes great thank you very much um, for the introduction we've learned um, quite a bit today about hygiene detection um, characterization and I'm happy now to speak with you about the whole treatment topic we have four topics on the agenda. First, a bit of um, basics on high frequency. Um, Professor Neumann will talk about polypectomy, EMR, and uh, how to handle the devices properly. And I will answer the question when to actually use which type of uh, snares, as there are quite many different types out there. First point uh, to differentiate a little is uh, the different frequency modes that are applied to tissues or ablation rather on a larger uh, surface um, at around 40 degrees, coagulation uh, taking place at around 60 degrees um, and then cutting, um, really destroying the cell structure and cutting through the tissue at around 100. If we're looking on the different setups uh, that we can choose, of course, mostly in endoscopy, uh, the monopolar setup, uh, where actually the energy flows back uh, uh, through the patient, through the electrode into the system, and of course, the bipolar setup. What does it actually uh, do to the tissue? So um, if you press your foot pedal, this starts the coagulation cycle where the tissue is actually being cut uh, and then in the next step, uh, the coagulation cycle prepared um, for the next uh, cycle where actually the hemostasis takes place. Um, the effect that it has on the tissue is determined by a couple factors. So the, of course, the electrical energy, you have thermal energy, you have mechanical energy by the closure of the snare uh, that in the end affects your um, um, yeah, effect on the tissue. So how that is cut, uh, how deep the coagulation is actually going into the tissue. And you can see a result on the picture quite nicely here, that coagulation margin. And uh, of course, there are many more factors influencing how that cutting result looks in the end. And to be aware that, of course, uh, the type of tissue you're uh, having, so whether you cut fibrotic tissue or normal one, how the tissue is hydrated. And I, I want to also touch that point, the actual snare and the wire type, which we will learn more in this session. Now over to Professor Neumann on the polypectomy and EMR part. Yes, thank you so much, um, Dominic. And um, I don't know why my camera is always switched off, but I'm still with you. I have to apologize. But of course, we all know that we have different polypectomy techniques like biopsy forceps, 
our preferred technique for smaller sized lesions, less than three millimeter in size. Uh, then for polypectomy, of course, we can decide if we should do cold or hot snaring. And then the larger the lesion is, typically for lesions larger than two centimeter in size, we prefer to use endoscopic mucosal resection. And if there is any sign of already a superficial invasion, and if there is a knowledge, then of course one can even uh, go to endoscopic submucosal dissection, hybrid techniques, or even endoscopic full thickness resection. So when we're discussing about hot snaring, we all know that we prefer to use the submucosal cushion, honestly, traditionally, because of course, potentially, especially when you're not in the small bowel or if you're not in the cecum, one can even do the hot snaring without any previous submucosal injection, but of course we prefer it uh, to use a submucosal cushion and afterwards we prefer to use a snare. For cold snaring, of course, this is not, this, uh, not the case. One can uh, use just the normal snare and one can use the mechanical traction in order to remove the polyp. So if we're looking for EMR, I feel it's very exciting to learn that we have various technologies. Uh, and the first one is, uh, ah, I'm back. So the first one is um, the traditional one with the injection, and then one can inject, one can place a snare and you can resect. So for traditional endoscopic mucosal resection, the second one is the so-called cap-assisted EMR from Japan. It's a technology which is not that much used anymore, specifically not in the colon because it is associated with a deeper tissue trauma or even perforation. Um, what one can do, especially when you have, for example, neuroendocrine tumors um, um, in the rectum, one can use ligation-assisted EMR, so very typical like band ligation of esophageal varices or even traditional uh, band ligation for stomach lesions. You just push, uh, you just place um, the band and then afterwards you can remove this residual polyp with your traditional snare. So about the complication in an endoscopy for EMR, we know that we have various types and um, the bleeding, of course, is the most common one, but we are not afraid of bleeding in endoscopy because as endoscopists, we all know how to stop a bleeding. So bleeding is traditionally not a problem for us. Uh, definitely the perforation might be a problem, although in recent years, it has even been uh, not that difficult anymore to close the perforations by means of hemoclips. Um, definitely, one should always do it in a zipper-like technique, so very important to uh, place the first clip above the perforation and not directly at the perforation site in order to have a zipper-like technique to close the perforation site. And again, it can only be possible to close a perforation when the bowel is really clean, when there is any stool, what you can see, which is going through the perforated site, then the patient needs surgery because afterwards they will develop a peritonitis. So therefore, um, when there is a perforation and the bowel is clean, one can do clipping to close the perforation in a zipper technique, and this is safe and efficient. But when you do polypectomy and there is a little bit of residual stool, and you can really see that the stool is going through, the patient would need surgery, even though you might be able to close a perforation. Stricture development, very uncommon, only for very large uh, lesions which are getting resected uh, in the esophagus. Uh, specifically when you're doing very large circumferential ESDs, but otherwise normally you do not have this problem. Uh, so very important, I feel Dominic is also now to learn what type of snare to use because we have so many snares and you are the snare master. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the, the question, of course, many of you have come across is actually um, with the variety of different snares out there, when to actually use which type. And to answer that question, I want to look uh, together with you on that topic from different angles. First one is the topic um, wire types. And you see here different wires that are used uh, in polypectomy snares, monofilament, uh, compacted wire technology, and, and braided wires. And the take-home take message for you on that point is really the thicker the wire is, um, the higher also the coagulation effect is on the tissue. So you can clearly see that on the pictures below here, uh, how deep that goes 
into the tissue. Another point to look at that um, in order to pick the right snares, of course, the different lesions that you're facing, you have the pedunculated ones uh, with a lot more vessels in there than, for example, your flapped or, or slightly raised ones. And in the end, you want to pick the right snare and to also have an appropriate coagulation uh, with that resection. So combining those two angles, you end up with that nice uh, overview here. So you can see uh, that the braided wire type of snares are obviously fitting that needs uh, for the pedunculated lesions. Whereas, for example, a monofilament where you have a bit more rigid snares, you can apply much nicer pressure to the tissue and grasp that flat lesion. As a conclusion, so there are many different factors you can go for and that are important in a, um, in a uh, resection. In the end, there is no ideal snare for all the types. So you always have to make a compromise in that field of tension and uh, either go for flexible or stiff or uh, a bit more coagulation uh, compared to your cutting effect. But Considering the different angles, I think that will help you to choose the right snare for your lesions. Of course, making that decision is one point, how to use them. I would like to hand back over to you, Professor Norman. Yeah, thank you. So device handling, I feel you're all experts. I can learn more from you on how to handle a device like this. Although, honestly, I'm one of those few endoscopists who is also uh, using the snare by himself. Specifically, according to training, it's very important. I learned it in Japan so uh, that also the doctor have some feeling of the snare. But traditionally, of course, uh, this is done by uh, the assistant. Of course, what is very important that nowadays we have really rotatable snares here as well. So one can really control the rotation of the snare. And we all know we always prefer to have a polyp at a six o'clock position in endoscopy in order to have a very fast and uh, safe removal of the lesion. Although sometimes this is very challenging to achieve. And I feel specifically for those indication indeed controlled rotation options are very helpful and I just want to show you in this video how this is a matwork snare how easy it is uh, to rotate the snare and one can imagine when you have a polyp which is not able to get in the right position yeah, in the flexures, maybe even in the cecum, uh, then this is the ideal snare because it's a fully rotatable 360 uh, degree snare. And we feel it's very helpful in our uh, clinical practice specifically for more challenging lesions. So when we're discussing about device handling, of course, we also want to shortly uh, discuss about the handling of cold and hot snares. Of course, we know for hot snare, and this is a nice picture, we are applying the energy. And most of you might use the Urbi generator and you know the higher the level, the higher the number what you have seen, the higher the voltage. So this is the idea of this number. So when you just set it to one, the voltage is low. When you set it to three, the voltage is much more higher. So the idea is to remove the voltage. So the number in areas where the mucosa is very thin, like in the right colon or in the duodenum, for example. Uh, although for pedunculated polyps, for example, where you have large tissue and where you also want to apply more energy in order to coagulate the feeding vessel, it might be helpful to increase a little bit the energy and not only the energy, of course, for uh, the cutting, but also for coagulation. Although, and this is a different topic, you know, uh, when you're putting the yellow pedal and you have an endocut effect, then uh, the system always applies uh, constantly first the cutting and then the coagulation. So uh, some endoscopists still do not know this and they always switch uh, through the different uh, pedals. So yellow and blue but uh, nowadays of course this is not necessary anymore just push the yellow puddle pedal with a endo cut and then uh, it go through with coagulation and cutting 
for coal snaring, of course, we do not need any energy, but we always only have to use mechanical cut. And therefore, of course, we prefer uh, stiff wire techniques, which are very easy to place around the tissue because with those larger size snares, it's nearly very challenging, uh, specifically, of course, in the sigmoid, where it's sometimes very narrow to uh, perform mechanical cutting of a device. So I feel it's very exciting what we have learned already today. And maybe Dominic, when you allow me to ask you the first question, because also this is something what I learned from you in recent uh, time. This is about the compact wire technology. And uh, so far we only know the traditional wire, which is just one wire or the braided wires, yeah, which is a cold wire snare. So what is now the compact wire and what makes the compact wire technology so special? And from your perspective, because you know about all the wires so good. Uh, why should we use maybe the compact wire technology? Thank you very much for that question. Um, in the end, compacted wire technology is combining the, the best aspects out of the two worlds, so from braided and monofilament. So you have um, a uh, intermediate coagulation effect on the tissue, and therefore you can apply that to a wider range of cases. And on the other side, due to that um, manufacturing process, the shape stability is also improved with that type of wires, especially when they uh, are used in cold snares. Uh, that is an important point. Cool, thank you. But you can also use it for cold um, resection. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is used in, in cold snares as well as in hot snares. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got the question. Uh, so I, I got the question, Andreas Jung, thank you so much for asking this. Uh, it's a very good one. And maybe some of you have already shown it in a Q&A session. So he's asking uh, my opinion about the hybrid snare. And I love the question if it's not only a bad compromise uh, in between uh, cold and hot snaring. So when you're asking me for my personal opinion, first of all, I had to say, I agreed uh, that this uh, should be a bad compromise. Although the the very new hybrid steers they are so so good and they are so effective so it's not a bad compromise anymore for example now practice we're using them from uh, mat work and it's a very good um, hybrid snare the advantage of course is that there is not so much you know the nurses are very fast in my unit uh, yeah but the more material we have of course the more challenging it is yeah with with everything, yeah. The more you have, the more time it takes for everything, for ordering, for for everything. So when we have something what you can use for everything and it works well, then of course it's highly appreciated. And I would say the new hybrid snares are really worth to get a trial. So when you do not have any experience with this, I would just recommend to uh, ask for some examples and then you you can try it by yourself. If if you feel it's a bad compromise or not, I would say it's not a bad compromise anymore. It's really working well. Yeah, but you, you also have larger polyps or smaller ones, and, and then you d don't have to change uh, the equipment during the, the procedure if, if you just use one, no? Yeah, you're right. And the new snares are really, although they are mm -hmm. sometimes really large size snares, yeah, but the opening diameter, even you can really resect mm -hmm. larger size lesions in one piece. And then at the same time, you can remove very small uh, diminutive polyps as well. Uh, that's really very exciting how fast this technology was going on in this years. Yeah. I got one question. Does um, any um, blood or air bubbles and stool or mucus have any effect on using um, the AI? Oh, that's a good question. And I feel Saskia Papa's video was very nice because mm -hmm. it has really shown a real, a real life situation with a little, lot of residual stool components. And um, uh, you have seen that AI was not detecting uh, the, the stool the residual stool components, but really only the polyps. So the systems are so well trained that they're not influenced by the air bubbles or even not by the stool. That's very exciting to, to see, but they are not getting disturbed. It's not a false positive sign what you get. Mm -hmm. But do, do I have a lot of false positive uh, signs with the AI? Or how can I, let's say, avoid to have uh, false positive um, uh, results? 
So honestly, it's not that often that you have really false positive results. Um, and again, we're using the system now for more than two years. Mm -hmm. So we have really a large scale experience on this. And we have also tried different systems. Uh, the system what we are at the moment using is a cat eye from Fujifilm and it's not that many uh, false positive results. Again, it's very important. We are not trusting the machine only. So we always need the validation by ourselves. Uh, so we are deciding if it's a polyp or a lesion or not. And this does not take any time. Again, I feel the most biggest important is really that it's so fast and it helps us to detect better. And even when we're getting tired, yeah, even today, now it's already past eight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when we should now do a screening colonoscopy, I think most of us, including myself, would be a little bit of tired. AI is not sleeping. Um, but when, when I have uh, AI, uh, how can I use AI uh, when I have uh, the polyp, let's say, rejected and I want to see are the edges clear, uh, clean? Um, uh, can I use that also with, uh, for, uh, with AI? Um, as you, you mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you mean how to mix it? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I, I did a polypectomy and uh, perhaps, or let's say an uh, EMR or whatever, I'm, I'm not sure, are the edges clean? Can I use the AI also for that? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, this is really depending on your uh, uh, cutting uh, setting. So when you really apply a lot of energy and you have really a lot of coagulation margin, this is identified by the system as a polypoid lesion. Mm -hmm. In our practice, we are re really using very low coagulation settings. Uh, so we have really very clean margins after polypectomy. Um, and then uh, the AI system is not interfered by this. But I feel this is a very important question. There are some studies ongoing with this, Ulrike. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because uh, this is really very much dependent on the, uh, on the electrosurgery settings, yeah. And one, one point concerning the learning curve again, when I have, let's say, the young endoscopist, the unexperienced one, and using the AI, it just tell me, yeah, it's hyperplastic or whatever, yeah. Um, how, how do you use the AI in that yeah, teaching the young generation? Yeah, that's a good point again. And uh, I feel we are just at the beginning and uh, definitely I would prefer that the colleagues are definitely learning the traditional idea on how to characterize polyps because again, the system is helping us, but the validation should be performed by, um, by the endoscopist, the nurse endoscopist or the, the traditional physician. Uh, so we cannot fully rely on the system. We always need the validation. And this is very important, even though when the system is telling us this is a lesion which is horrible, but you as an endoscopist, you're convinced this is just a fold. Of course, you're not removing it. Mm -hmm. So the validation only goes with the endoscopist and therefore traditional training of the endoscopist is of course still extremely important. The system is helping us like the navigation system in the car, you know, and we all know those funny videos when the navigation system tells go right and they are driving in the river. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, the it's the same as for AI. So it's guiding our way, but the final decision, what road we are taking, this is done by the endoscopist. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't give me really a detailed characterization. It just gives me a rough uh, um, character characterization. Huh? I I love this question, you know, so we have, we have shown you the, the characterization yeah. part. It was yellow and it was green. That's it. So yeah. I do not want to hypothesize, but you know, so when it's like the ample system, red color is still missing. So I could imagine that in the future, the red color will also be there highlighting that it's a more invasive disease, for example, mm -hmm. which really requires endoscopic therapy. I feel we are just at the beginning with this technology, but you're right so far, it's only neoplasia and hyperplasia, but I would say in the in the future, the system will even tell us tubular adenoma, tubular villus adenoma, villus type of adenoma, serrated lesion, or maybe even in the future um, about the SM infiltration, just submucosal superficial invasion of the disease to guide endoscopic therapy. There, there is one last question concerning the technical equipment. Do I need, um, the question was, do I need f further, let's say, monitors or do I just use one monitor, which then include all the um, 
the information because in the endoscopy setting, I often have different monitors for, let's say the nurses from that side, the endoscopist from that side. How can uh, this be established? Uh, this is an excellent question. Honestly, also for us, this was one of the major decision to use the Fujifilm system that no additional monitor is required because if we you just have additional monitors where you have the AI uh, system, then it takes too much time. You always have to switch in between and you need so much additional space. So um, when you, for example, use the cat eye, you just have one monitor and everything mm -hmm. is, uh, is shown this. I love this question very much because again, this was a major decision for us to use the system mm -hmm. because the more monitors we have, we already have so many uh, uh, at one point, you're also where to look at. Yeah. So very important question. Love it. Thank you. So it's uh, age 10, so, uh, and a lot of people are still with us. So that really shows that it was a very, very interesting and um, yeah, with a high educational value um, webinar. So thank you very much. It was a very good combination of these technical issues and then also the medical um, perspective and then also the combination with hygiene and equipment care. So that really gave us a lot of tips and tricks for our daily practice. So again, thank you very much um, um, for all of you. Um, and uh, I would like to um, invite you to the next um, um, uh, as Gina webinar, we will go to a small holiday break, but we will meet again in September. And um, uh, for September, we also um, plan the as Gina um, uh, 25th anniversary, and we will um, have a small celebration at the UEG week. And we will have um, some lectures there every um, day we have two SGNA lectures before the um, SGNA uh, uh, conference and the UG week. We will have some warm ups and you will get uh, the detailed information for that um, in September. We will have some small webinars with the um, industry as well. So we all wish you a nice and relaxing summertime, whatever you want to do. If you go to the Alps, to the mountains, if you go bicycle or if you just lay at the beach and enjoy the warm weather. So thank you very much again to the team. It was a great pleasure. And um, yeah, have a nice summer to everybody and now a nice week, uh, now a nice evening. So thank you so thank much. You. Bye bye and take care. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Take care.